Hi everybody, welcome to our 30 day growth challenge devotional. My name's Kurt Joyner. I'm a leader here at the Way World Outreach and today we're gonna to be looking at James 4 verses one through three. You know, yesterday, Mikkel covered James 3, 17 and 18, and we learned that wisdom from above is pure, peace-loving, gentle at all times, and willing to uh, yield to others. And it's full of mercy, and it's the fruit of good deeds. And the key takeaway I know yesterday that he talked about was a peacemaker plants or sows seeds in, of peace, and he reaps a harvest of righteousness. Well, today, we're gonna look at the exact opposite of a peacemaker. So join me in uh, reading James 4, 1 through 3, and then we'll break it down. Uh, what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You're jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. Yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And even when you do ask, you don't get it because your motives are all wrong. You only want it what will give you pleasure. Hmm. Wow. Let, let's break this down. There's three truths that I see in this scripture. Truth number one is we're either being led by the Spirit or we're being led by our flesh. See, at the beginning of chapter 4, James shifts gears and he starts talking about Christians that are being led by the flesh, Christians. He describes strife among Christians as quarrels or fights. You know, I looked up the word quarrel and the definition of quarrel is a heated argument or disagreement, typically about a trivial issue <laughs> and between two people who are usually on good terms. Wow, often the heated arguments and disagreements that Christians get into can end up becoming pretty severe, pretty bitter. And the source of these quarrels and fights is always the same. It's our flesh. You know, there's an internal war going on inside every believer regarding the lust of the flesh. You know, James says it comes from, quote, evil desires at war within you and I. And that we want what others have and we're jealous of what others have and we fight and wage war to take it from them. These evil desires lead to hatred and conflict. And James even says that we may be led to our flesh to scheme and kill to get what we want. Wow, wow. See, this is a real battle and we need to know who the real enemy is. It's not the other person and it's not the circumstances. It's our flesh. See, circumstances never define you and I, but our choices do. See, Paul tells us in Romans 7, 15, I don't really understand myself, for I want to do what's right, but I don't do it. Instead, I do what I hate. And what he's talking about is that battle inside. Our flesh is carnal. Billy Graham, great quote here. He says, carnal is a biblical word that is not used much anymore, but it has a powerful effect in our lives. It means living life consumed by satisfying fleshly desires, feeding selfishness while serving the body and starving the soul. Wow, so we're feeding the flesh and starving the soul? We can't do that. So how do we know that we are being led by the Spirit? In Galatians 5, 22 through 26, they call this the fruits of the Spirit. It says, but the Holy Spirit produces this kind of fruit in our lives, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There's no law against these things. He goes on to say, those who belong to Christ, that's you and I, Christians, have nailed the passions and desires of their sinful nature to his cross and crucified him there. Wow. Since we're living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives. And he goes on to say, last thing, let us not be conceited or provoke one another or be jealous of one another. Wow. So we know that we have the fruits of the Spirit when we exemplify those traits. No two believers that are walking in the Spirit of God are going to have conflict because they're going to both offer up love and forgiveness for the other. Truth number two is we have not because we ask not. James said at the end of verse two, 
yet you don't have what you want because you don't ask God for it. What James is doing, he's reminding us of the great power of prayer. See, there's no reason for you and I to live a spiritually poor life. He's saying that we may not have simply because we don't pray. Or when we pray, we forget to ask. God tells us to keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. He wants us to ask. He alone has the best plan and purpose for our lives, and He doesn't want it to be a secret. Jeremiah 29, 11 through 13 says, For I know the plans I have for you, says the Lord. They're plans for good and not for disaster, to give you a future and a hope. In those days when you pray, I'll listen, and if you look uh, for me wholeheartedly, us, we're looking for him wholeheartedly, we will find him. It goes on to say in Romans 12, 2, that don't copy the behavior and customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. Then you'll learn, what, uh, you'll learn to know God's will for you, which is good and pleasing and perfect. See, you and I need to change our thinking. We know that God's got a plan for us. We know we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. We know that when we're weak, He's strong. We know that all things work together for good for those who love God and are called according to His purpose. We know that we need wisdom and, and he, asks, he tells us to ask. We know there's no weapon formed against us that can prosper. So we know that God's got a plan. And the enemy just wants, the enemy can do nothing to defeat God's plan for our lives. But he wants to discourage us. So he casts doubt and unbelief at us. And either we resist that doubt and unbelief with the truth, with the word of God, or we accept that doubt and unbelief and we use it like bricks and mortar, and we start building a wall between us and the plan that God's got for our life. He casts the doubt, and, and if we entertain that doubt, we, we put a brick down. If he casts an unbelief at us, then all of a sudden we put some mortar down, and all of a sudden we build a wall, and we, we can even start to think crazy thoughts like, where is God? Does he even care? Does he have a plan for me? Because we can't see it anymore. Of course he does but we can't see it because of the wall that we build of doubt and unbelief. The great news about that though, is it's a paper tiger. It's like those banners you see at football games. They look intimidating, they look big, but the first football pair runs through and it just shatters, it breaks away easily. That's why Jesus tells us in Matthew 17, 20, you don't have enough faith, Jesus told them. I tell you the truth, if you had faith even as small as a mustard seed, you would say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it would move. Nothing would be impossible. See, an action step, pray and ask God to declare and, and declare the word of God over our lives at all times, in all circumstances. You know, truth number three, last one. When we do ask, we must ask with the right motives. See, after dealing with the problem of no prayer, now James addresses the problem of selfish prayer. When, when they ask God with selfish motives, you know, the purpose of prayer is not for God to be our genie in a bottle and to make our wishes come true, but it's for us to align our will with His. And in partnership with Him, to ask Him to accomplish His will on this earth. Matthew 6.10 says this, May your kingdom come, soon and may your will be done on earth as it is in heaven man i hope you've enjoyed diving into james 4 1 through 3 with me today and as you can see this passage really has some important foundational truths for our faith and for our lives and before i uh, you go today i'd like to encourage you to take a moment to put comments in the section or maybe share this with others share it with anyone and everyone and tomorrow we're going to continue our study on the book of James. So let's close out in a word of prayer. Lord, I just ask that each and every one of us would be led by your spirit, Lord, that we would study and meditate on your word and we would apply it and do what it says, Lord, and that you would transform our lives so that we can have the game plan and the purpose and, and the vision that you have for our life. Not a good plan, but a God plan. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.